Welcome back to Icons, and today we have a very special guest with us, somebody who's killed it as Future Trunks in the English dub of Dragon Ball Super's Future Trunks arc, but he also played Sanji in One Piece, Justin Law in Soul Leader, Leo in Fairy Tale. There's so many characters throughout the years that he's played. Please welcome to Geekdom 101, Mr. Eric Vale. How are you, sir? I'm good, brother. How are you doing? I'm very good, but you're probably tired because you're always on a plane, it seems. I always see you on a plane. I am. I am always on a plane. I was. Uh, I'm more tired now than normal because I was at a convention in Huntsville, Alabama, which is awesome because uh, we uh, we raised money, raised a thousand dollars for the Red Cross for the tornado victims in South Alabama, which was cool, great for the convention. But as we were leaving the convention, uh, we uh, our, our flight was canceled. So I, and that was at seven o'clock at night. So I rented a truck i drove through alabama and mississippi into memphis tennessee and caught the last plane out got home in the middle of the night and uh i haven't quite yet caught up on my rest since then hell i'm still waiting for my bag to be delivered to my house jesus well it's just funny that you actually drove to another town to catch a flight like that's that's effort (laughs) it is not the first time i've done it i i did it uh i did it one other time i was in jacksonville and you see, usually I t- now I've learned to take Mondays after conventions off if I can. Uh, but one time I had a huge job scheduled on Monday. I was in Jacksonville, Florida. The flight was canceled. I wouldn't get out until the next day. So I rented a car and I drove faster than I should have driven down to Orlando and caught a flight there home so I could get to the job on Monday. That's uh, that's my neighborhood right there, uh, Tampa and Orlando. Uh, yeah. And Jacksonville, Florida. So, all right, let's go back to the beginning. I read somewhere that you did not want to be an actor when you were a kid. Like, what did you want to be when you were a kid? No, 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 no. I did. That's oh, you in, did? I, okay. That's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Yeah, I think what you're probably hearing is that I wasn't raised for that. I, I, live, I live still in Texas. I'm a native Texan. I love it here. And... um uh, r- raised here by a by a football player from A and M. So naturally, growing up, all my pictures, all my baby pictures, have me holding footballs and baseballs and baseball mitts. And um, my father just expected me to be a football player. And I'm built like a football player. I just don't like sports. So wow. And, and also, I'm ugh, I'm terrible at them. I, I'm really good at bar sports. I can play billiards, darts shuffleboard but you get me out onto a field and i'm i'm terrible so uh, i was 10 years old uh i lived in beaumont texas and there was hardly anything to do <clears throat> excuse me but go to the movies so uh that summer of 84 uh, indiana jones and the temple of doom obviously was out and i saw it like eight times in the theaters and i said hey man that's what i want to do i want to be an actor and uh, uh never never look back it's funny because 84 was a great year for movies. I mean, yes. that was the year – because it wasn't just Indiana Jones. I mean, that was also the year I was born. But um, oh. we had Ghostbusters that year uh-huh. and Terminator yeah. and Gremlins and Beverly Hills Cop. And there's a lot – and Nightmare on Elm Street and, Part 1. And, and uh, yeah, Beverly, Beverly Hills Cop. Let's see what else. Uh, there's Karate Kid, Real Genius, Footloose. I mean, the list is insane for that year. Yes, that was a great year. Romancing the Stone, uh, mm-hmm. Police Academy, which I like, even though it seems to be a hated movie. I don't know why people hate Police Academy. It's great. Yeah, I agree. At least the first four. So what were your – you wanted to be a, a, a film actor, a stage actor, or just anything? You were wanted to do anything? Well, you know, the, the uh, youthful mentality is uh, – Oh, hey, look, that's that's uh, Harrison Ford. He plays Indiana Jones. Well, I want to be Indiana Jones. I want to be a movie star. So that's that's kind of what happens. I mean, I, you know, I always I always think back to uh, Silence of the Lambs where uh, the line in there is you covet what you see every day. And what I saw every day was movies. So uh, I watched all these films. and I watched all these actors. And I just I just thought, hey, you know what? Um I'm going to learn how to do this. I'll move out to L.A. and I'm going to be a movie star. And as I got older, I got a little more practical, obviously, and learned once I started studying acting that I loved acting. And uh, in order to be a successful actor, in my opinion, you need to just 
study acting and be an actor. And the best place to do that is the stage. And that's where I started. So started on stage in high school, up through college and then started doing film and TV work. And by the time I was in college, uh, I knew it's like, oh, acting is uh, it's a profession. You know, you're you're fortunate if you get to do it in any capacity. And uh, so I worked to do that. And the voice acting thing just happened because of proximity, mostly. You mean because it was in Texas? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was, uh, it, you know, it's right here in just outside of Dallas. So, I, um, it was an easy, easier place to get an audition at than someplace in Los Angeles where I, you know, didn't live. And it's very expensive. You know, I do find it funny too that Terminator came out in '84, and Toriyama loves that movie so much that he pretty much made his own version of Kyle Reese, which is you. Yes. You know? <laughs> so, who, who, who is an actor I met? last weekend for the first time michael bain yes oh yeah. dude i love tombstone was another great movie he did dude oh come on the abyss yes uh, aliens no yeah he, i mean what yeah he's so freaking good man so what is your favorite film if you don't mind me asking or your favorite films if you have more than one i, I have plenty of favorites and my favorites tend to sort of uh, vacillate based on you know my mood, but my probably my favorite movie is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Really, that's an in, yeah. that, well, I mean, that's Spielberg when he was in his peak. You know what I yeah. mean? He was yeah. everything he was dropping was freaking fire. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, man, it's 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 it is it's Spielberg in top form. It's uh, you know, it's so well crafted. It is still to this day got some of the scariest scenes in it. And also, like my probably my favorite thing about it is that it shows, in my opinion, actual real life America, where you know this is a this is a family that doesn't quite get along, like a lot of regular families, and uh, th that is what I love about it because it makes it makes you feel less isolated. Yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Um, so let's talk about auditioning for Trunks in 99 because this is a different kind of audition. And what I mean by that is this for those people out there who don't know. Um, other actors like Sabat, Sonny Strait, Shemmel, uh, they came in and they were replacing the uh, Vancouver Ocean dub group. So they had to kind of emulate their voices and um, try their best to sound like the originals before they went and did their own thing. Uh, or, you know, like like their pre predecessors. But with Trunks, this is a new character. So you were not picking it up from a previous English dub actor. So you had free reign to create that voice? Um, yeah, I did. I mean, free reign, yes. But I didn't know what I was doing. So it was more like follow my director's lead at that point. And the director was Chris Sabat. I, uh, I had... Uh, what happened was I was delivering pizzas up in Denton, Texas, where I was going to college, and uh, a friend of mine who I was in college theater with I hadn't seen in a, a little while, she showed up to the pizza joint one time, and she said, hey, I'm doing this um, uh, I'm doing this cartoon. She, she was Bulma, it's Tiffany Vollmer, and yeah, she, yeah. she didn't know – I mean none of us knew what was going on. She didn't really know. She just took the gig. And she's like, you know, I think you you got a great voice. You'd be really good at this. Give this dude a call and go in there and audition. So I uh, I went in, I auditioned. Uh, I want to say, I went in there and I, that was it. I went in there and I did a cold audition. They were not casting anything at the time. And I went in and auditioned just some roles and gave them a headshot and resume and left and then uh, I guess it was like three weeks later that Chris called me back to specifically audition for the role of Trunks. They were, he said that he couldn't find the right voice for it, and he remembered me because of the headshot. And I went in, auditioned, and I went back, I believe, for a callback the, the next day or two later. And then we set the voice and started working the next day. So it was that easy. I mean, it's, sometimes it's harder from what I understand, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was pretty – I'm probably glossing over it a little bit, but it was pretty hard considering I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So, you know, as an actor up to that, uh, up to that point, every single audition I'd ever done, people were looking at my face, you know, uh, whether so I was – this is your first voice audition. 
Yeah, yeah, I oh, did wow. not. Yeah, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I knew that it's like, okay, well, act without using your face, body, or anything, only your voice. And it was a bit of a challenge, but um, Sabbat really, I think he appreciated the background that I had, that I was, you know, a theater major and, and, uh, and I was working professionally in the industry in Dallas, which was a lot smaller back then. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I was the only or first actual actor that came in there, male actor, because you know, Tiffany was already there, but he said that there weren't a lot of actors, that a lot of the people that were doing that stuff at the time were uh, musicians. And that's important because with anime, timing is such an issue. So musicians did really, they do really well at voice acting for anime. So, wow. So, uh, that was your first voice audition and you got it. And it's a major character, uh, a yeah. huge character for the entire arc. I wanted to ask you, you know, you did the show, Dragon Ball Z blew up, then came Fruits Baskets, Yu Yu Hakusho, and I know it's coming back, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, at this point, with Funimation kind of growing and getting all these new properties, did you think at that point, like, after you got done doing Trunks for just that arc, that, okay, I can do this full time now, like, you know, we're getting licensed, like, got a good reputation here, a good career, like, what was kind of going through your head as Funimation was growing? Uh, you know, I... I... <sighs> Sort of. I didn't say, I didn't think that like I was going to like, oh, hey, I've made it and I can just keep doing this. Um, luckily, m my father raised me uh, to work hard, but he's a, uh, he was always a contract worker. And that's what an actor is, is a contract worker. 1099. Take, there you go, baby. You take right, this 1099s. Right. And uh, he, uh, you know, he worked in, uh, or still does. He runs a, actually, he runs a, very successful construction company that I watched him build from the ground up through work ethic that he that he taught me, which is basically that, you know, work hard, don't get comfortable. And so that's what I did. I just put my nose to the grindstone. And the funny the funny story of it is that I was still delivering pizzas and um, they uh, uh, I got, you know, I was called in to deliver this pizza to this guy and I, I delivered it and he opened the door and he was busy watching TV and he wouldn't really pay attention to me cause he's glued to the TV and he's standing there. He's like, Oh, hold on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here, hey, dude, give me the money. And his buddy runs the money up and they're all glued to the TV. And then I heard my voice coming out of the television. That's great. That and is amazing. They're all watching Dragon Ball Z and the trunk stuff. And, and I, you know, I took their money, handed them the pizza, and walked out and, and thought to myself, I should probably quit delivering pizzas. You know? That's, that is, um, did you tell them anything or do the voice for them or anything? <laughs> no, no, no. And I just, I just left and, um, and then I quit. I did. I quit delivering pizzas and decided to act full time and I started acting full time. And, uh, there was, at the time, there was a lot to do up at Funimation. Uh, there was, you know, I was playing trunks. It was, very busy. I was in the booth. I, I mean, many, many hours a week. And then right on the heels of that, we started doing my second show, which was blue gender. And I was the lead in that. And that That's was a right. run, lots and lots of hours. And then down the hall was uh, John Bergmeier. He was the, uh, I think we called it script supervisor at the time. And he was writing the scripts along with a couple of other people. So I went in there and I handed him a screenplay that I had written and I said, hey, dude, I, I'm a writer and I'd love to write because I was trying to make, you know, working entertainment my, my job. So he took the script, taught me how to do the job, and for 10 years I was a head writer at Funimation as well as voice actor. So what are the duties of a head writer? Because I know you have the – like an ADR is one thing and then you have like the, the translator. So mm -hmm. is your job to make – the the words match with the mouth flaps or is that's more yeah. the director's job right no that's the writer's job first. okay okay the yeah, writer. You, okay uh, you get uh you get the video and a translation and then your job is to time code the script and structure the script into the format and then import the translation into the script but then um make it make sense to the english audience you know because Oftentimes in Japanese, once things are translated, they get switched around. Sometimes they're backwards. And your job is to, you know, reformulate it so that to the English ears, it sounds natural. 
No, and and that's interesting because you have to make it sound like it's not Americanizing, but you have to make it make sense. I was going to ask you, um, because you said you work with Sabbath. Did you ever work with Barry Watson? Because a lot of people kind of credit him as the guy who took the dub in that, you know, censorship kind of, you know, I don't even know what you call it. The old Z dub, I mean, not Kai. Uh, So how was he to work with? Because is that true? Is that is it fair to say that? It wasn't Barry. No, I mean, uh, it was uh, it I mean, Barry was the producer, yes. you know, and everyone can blame him. But those Barry was doing what he was told to do by the people who were running the company at the time. And those people no longer run the company, but they they were very specific about some of their ideas. And and uh, and it was his job to, you know, implement them with us. And it was funny because working with Barry was I don't know. It was weird. A lot of people, you know, would clash with him. I never had a problem with him. He and I always got along very well. In fact, so well that once he left Funimation and started up his, he started up another dubbing company and I went to work with him as a director. Um, and, uh, while I was still working at Funimation, luckily that's the thing about being a contract worker is you, you're not exclusive to any one place. You can work wherever you want. And so, I worked with him for a couple years directing at his uh, other studio until they shut down and he moved on to other things. You know, I never had trouble working with him. And once I worked with him on the ground as a director uh, and he was in charge, uh, none of those things happened. You know, the things that people were concerned about, you know, censorship, HFIL and all that kind of crap. Yeah, and plus Blue Gender was like a hardcore dub. That was like... You know what I mean? Like when you did that, that, that was not kidified, <laughs> if that makes no, sense. No, but we uh, we recorded that at night, and uh, it was at the it was kind of like we were under a veil of secrecy. We could just sort of, you know, after five or six o'clock, that studio was empty. I mean, there was no one in there but me and Chris Sabat and an engineer, if we had one. Wow. So, so what you're saying, cause I've heard this from other actors too, cause I've heard like Barry gets blamed for a lot of stuff, but I've heard people like Brian Drummond say, no, B- Barry's a funny guy. He's a yeah. cowboy. Like, so it's like, uh, I guess it just depends on your experiences with him. Barry's Barry's uh, he's, he's an enigma. And this is the thing that I tell, tell yeah, people he is. <laughs> uh, about living in Texas. Like, Okay, so uh, years ago when they legalized, uh, you know, when the whole gay marriage legalization uh, came around, uh, some I watched some news station, and uh, they were trying to do some gotcha stuff, and they drove out into West Texas and knocked on the doors of farmers out in West Texas, some dudes out in the desert, and asked them what they thought about gay marriage, and they never got the opinion they were looking for. You know, like I remember one, it was this big beer belly, beer belly dude with a giant gray beard, cowboy hat, looked like he'd lived on this farm for 50, 60 years. And they're like, well, what do you think about gay marriage? And he goes, I don't, I don't see what the big deal is. They, uh, you know, you want two dudes that they fall in love, they want to get married. I don't, don't matter to me. That's great. Yeah. Yes, they, they were expecting that, you know, traditional answer of uh, uh, it's disgusting. They didn't get it. Right. No, no, no. And that was the thing that I always got from Barry is, is he – because he was that guy, he was, a you know, a country dude. Or he is, you know. But he's also very kind and a good husband and fantastic father and – uh, really funny, but a very dry personality. So sometimes people with dry personalities, I think, get get a bad shake, you know. Right. right. So, so with Kai, you came back to do Trunks again. Uh, very different. With Kai, they wanted to make it much more for the hardcore fan. They kept the script more accurate. How mm-hmm. did you approach Trunks and Kai coming back after 10 years, really? I mean, you did the video games, but besides that. Um, I tried to approach it the same way as I did the first time, but, um, just with a more, uh, well, put now it, you like, knew the character. Now you knew the yeah, York yeah. more tools in my tool chest. Cause when I started playing trunks, I was still learning how to voice act. And, uh, when I came back for Kai, I'd been voice acting long enough to be, 
become an expert. You know, 5,000 hours makes you an expert in something. I'm an expert now. Right. And so I thought, all right, I can come at it with a different toolbox. And, uh, and I, I, I tried really hard and, and, um, to be completely honest, I think my trunks was, um, better in, uh, DBZ rather than Kai because, um, the difference between the two helped the character the first time around more. You know what I mean? Because the first time around, I was naive. I didn't know what I was doing, very much like the character. Right, yeah. And he he didn't know what was going on. He was trying to figure it out. He had this dad, these daddy issues. But now with Kai, it's like you kind of know everything. I, I noticed that with the Japanese dub of Kai, too. I noticed that the performances on that one are... Uh, well, then again, the actors are also a lot older. So, I mean, that could be like way older in Japan. True, true, yeah. Now, speaking of which, with Super, came back to do Trunks. Now Trunks is older. And actually, it's roughly around the same time as the old Z-dub as far as like how much time passed in Trunks' timeline. Did your voice sort of change as you matured like Trunks? And does it make your new Super Trunks more authentic? Oh, I don't know if authentic is the right word. Um, yeah, I don't know I, if it is either. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's aged for sure because I've aged. And look, man, I, I you know, it's I don't have much of a choice but to use the voice I have. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe I, I think it for super it added a level of uh, gruffness that I didn't have the first time around. And also, I'm super sorry about. My lawn men being here right now and my dog freaking out. <laughs> I can still hear you, though. All right, cool. No, it's fine. Um, no, you were, you were saying that his voice uh, was gruff here? Yeah, the voice was – It's. It, it, I felt uh, gruffier. I felt more grizzled the second time because I just wrecked my voice for so, so many years. And uh, I, I felt that – made for a more world weary trunks for db super now what are your thoughts just as a as an observer i guess you can say i don't want to say a fan because that's not fair to you but uh your thoughts on the ending of that arc very dark very polarizing the future timeline was wiped away by zeno and they had to send trunks and my to another timeline that was created with beers to the whole so what did you think about that ending because it's been very heavily criticized and not just it's not a happy ending but because it's a weird kind of rushed ending. Uh, you know, I don't know. I I was hoping that the reason that was happening was because um, they were setting up some kind of other arc or spinoff or something. Me too, actually. <laughs> that would happen in the world where there are two trunks and two mys, you know. No, for sure. Maybe they'll have a kid, and maybe the kid will end up being like a new character or something. There's a lot of stuff, stuff they can do with this. I mean, he's there alive. He's there. Yeah, and there's there's a lot there's there's opportunity there. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but I think probably it was. Uh, and and I, I try to look at everything from the business perspective. Like that to me looks like a hedging your bet kind of move, where it's like, hey, uh, we're going to put this in our pocket just in case some of these other things go south on us. We've got this thing to go back to. And you know. they, they keep relying on nostalgia, too. They bring back old characters, Broly, Frieza, Trunks. It's, everybody's coming back. Right, yeah. right. So. Yeah. So I don't see why it won't bring him back. I think he'll come back. So what's your favorite role besides Trunks? Or is Trunks your favorite role? Is it? Like, what is your favorite role of all time, career-wise? Man, I, I had the best. Uh, it's personal. but You know, it would be like what I had the best time doing, and that would be Desert Bomb. Why that one, if you don't mind me asking? Because I got to be a, uh, I got to act like an idiot and uh, say a whole bunch of dirty jokes, and you know it was just, and and working with uh, I, Zach Bolton and Jeremy Inman were directing, so it was just a really fun collaborative time where we we just we got to just have fun we weren't worried about a fan base we weren't worried about if we were going to make people on the internet happy we were just telling dick jokes <laughs> mainly <laughs> you know and uh and it was a blast i just had a great time doing it that reminds me i want to ask you about comedy and improv i talked to chris rager about improv and 
I know is that something you enjoy? Because I know you have this thing going on with folding chairs, and I wanted to give you a chance to kind of yeah. talk about that and and the whole like your whole history with like your love of improv. I love. I, I do. I do love improv. I. I was. You know. Uh, in theater, they teach everything. You know, and so that's that's how I got trained, and I love improv because I like I like the freedom and the creativity of it. Um, so that's, that's a really good, that's a really good time. Well, is it, is it challenging? Oh. Yeah, it's just audio. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, man. My, my wife's walking through here and she just looked down and she goes, is that just audio? Because you know, it's morning and we all look like the way that we look. <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, I, I promise her I won't take up too much more of your time. I no, that's right. I don't. Um, well, I'm sorry. Where were we? That was, that was no. I was just going to ask you about improv. Is it challenging to do improv and coming up with jokes on the fly versus like pre-writing your jokes? It's everything's got. See, our our comedy our comedy troupe is more of a sketch comedy troupe. We love we love the creativity of of writing and collaborating in our group and coming up with cool characters that we can really flesh out. Um, but improv. Hell, improv is sometimes where you discover those characters. So I think both of those types of comedy kind of work in conjunction with one another. Mm -hmm. But as far as improv, the thing that improv helps me with, uh, like being like being on it, is uh, improv helps me at a, at a Q and A. It helps me uh, interact with the audience and it helps me to think quicker on my feet in life, you know, in, in any moment, because you're trained to one of the, like the core of improv is yes. And that's the idea in the improv. You're never supposed to say no. You're only supposed to accept what is happening as the truth and then play the scene or play the moment. And to me, that's the best way to approach life you know you can you can stop and look around and say no 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 or you can say yes and now what because your life's happening all the time these moments are happening in front of you some of them are really crappy some of them are good but it's it's important to be able to roll with the punches and improv has helped me in life to be able to do that as well as in my work environment so somebody told me to ask you, and I have no context for this, but they told me to ask you about Super Clown. <laughs> I know who told you that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Super Clown, man. That, um, you know, the first, you know, it's kind of hard. Everyone's an enigma, man. Nobody is exactly who you think they are, right? Yes. We were talking about Barry earlier. Well, you know, I told you the story about how my father was a football player and expected me to be a football player. Yes. Well, <laughs> when I when I was growing up, I was living in Beaumont, Texas. It's a very small town. My dad, uh, ha he worked for one company, uh, lost that job, and and then worked for another company, and and then that didn't work out too. And it, during these times. We, we didn't have a lot of money. We were very poor, man. I We would literally go down to the coast, which was not too far of a drive, and we'd uh, crab. We'd, we'd pull crab out of the out of the ocean. Um, wow. And that's what we would eat that week because we didn't have money enough to go to the grocery store. We just – we had enough to get bait and go fishing basically. And during that time, my dad – He's always been – my dad's a huge personality and he's always been the life of the party and he's always had a little bit of a performer vibe. That's where I get it from. Uh, and he decided during that time that he wanted to be a clown. He knew how to juggle. He's an excellent juggler and he started teaching himself magic tricks. And then he developed this clown personality called Super Clown and he would put on a Superman shirt <laughs> – he put on a yellow Superman shirt and uh, a big uh, red Afro wig, if I remember correctly, or a yellow Afro wig, I forget, and uh, and paint himself up as a clown. And he would go to kids' birthday parties and do magic tricks and entertain and juggle. And, and then my uncle started doing it, and they, they did it together. Um, and he called himself Super Clown. 
And so Super Clown was what I grew up with. My dad would do magic tricks in front of me and my brother for hours on end until he got them right. And he would have us judge his uh, his performance. And then he had us, yeah, go to birthday parties with him and entertain the other kids. We would go into parades. My, me and my brother had our own clown personalities that he invented for us. And that, that was wow. my life growing up. Uh, so it was weird. It's like on some hand, my dad was this crazy clown performer who was making, you know, working hard, making money for his family. And on the other side, he sold shocks for Monroe. So your dad was an athlete, but he was also a comedian and a, per and a performer. So I guess, you know, he wanted you to be uh, an athlete, but you took the other side, the, the, the performance side. So I, he had to have been happy with that. Well, oh yeah, he ultimately is. I mean, he, I had lunch with him yesterday and we were talking about it, but he, uh, yeah, I think in a lot of different ways, what I ended up doing with my life is what he would have or should have ended up doing with his life. Not that he's, you know, a failure. He's a huge success. Construction but, uh, company. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's huge, but, um, I think he wanted, um, it's, it's nice that he, he's able to have a part of something that I think growing up, you grow up in Texas in the sixties. Um, you're not told that you can do anything you want to do. You know what I mean? You're, you're told these are the things you can do. And he was kind of told football is the thing you can do and, and did it, you know, worked real hard at it. But, uh, I think he wanted to be an actor and you did it. So yeah, <laughs> living vicariously. So, you mentioned that your daughter was diagnosed with autism. Can you tell us about your autism awareness uh, programs and, and everything you're doing with, with that so that way the people can kind of, you know, know more about that side of you, you know, the, the, the sure. The, yeah. yeah. Um, on my, on my website, uh, I have, uh, I have links to special needs, uh, programs and support that people might need, not just for autism, but being that that's my life, that's my focus. Um, on April, well, April's Autism Awareness Month, and on April first, my my whole life goes blue for autism. So I'm, my website will be blue. Hell, I changed the light at my front door to blue, and um, wow. we're, uh, and I'm going to be uh, supporting the charity. Uh, it's not really a charity so much, but the group is called Acing Autism, and it's this group here in Dallas that teaches tennis to autistic children and adults. And, and they play in the special Olympics and everything. It's a great group. It t teaches, you know, the autistic youngsters, uh, things like social skills and exercise and community. And it's just, it's a really great, great group of people. So you'll provide links to, I mean, I'll put links to that in the description down below and probably a pinned comment so everybody can check that out for sure because sure. um, you're working on a lot of philanthropic stuff didn't you aren't you doing like a cancer thing as well with uh with folding chairs am i right on that yeah yeah with the folding chairs we are um uh our show here in it's actually in plano texas on march 30th um the uh we're going to be supporting some local cancer charities uh that's what that show is all about um it's the uh, are we are we clean or dirty on this? On uh, this? It's really up to you. Um, I know your show is dirty. Um, <laughs> it is. It is. It's, I'll just say it's the it's the F cancer show, and um, right. that's that's it's all dirty jokes, and um, well, mostly dirty jokes. A couple of not dirty jokes, and um, and then we donate all the money to local cancer charities, and we're also going to be performing at KameaCon um, in the middle of April uh, and that's Saturday I believe at 6 p.m. at KameaCon we're going to be performing and same thing we're going to be donating that uh, any money that people donate to us during that performance also to local cancer charities and um, and then also for April I've got you know like I said acing autism and uh, last weekend at the convention I was at in Huntsville raised money for the Red Cross so Trying nice. to trying to give back, man, as much as I can. I've I've been fortunate enough. It's it's time to return. 
No, and it feels good when you do. So, yeah, if people are coming to KameaCon, you'll not only get to meet Eric, that's April 12th to the 14th, and talk to him, but he will perform for you. And that's going to be a cool thing Saturday night. I actually am excited for that. I, that's one of the highlights. The, the, the show is so stacked. It's just, I don't know how we're going to be able to top it next year. It's just, if we even do one now, I don't even know what's going to happen. But it's so insanely stacked. And when I found out about you performing live, I'm like, wow. And there's also a big Rio Horikawa performance the day before, which I don't know if we're supposed to talk about yet, but oh, well, the cat's out of the bag. So we've got actors doing performances live, and that's that's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, I'm... Sorry, I had to go to the back of my house to get away from the lawn guys. No, it's okay. Cool. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Very, uh, I don't know, I'm very excited. I'm excited to be able to show people who know me just for the anime stuff that, you know, I do all this other stuff too. I'm pretty sure Josh Martin has like a, a Beastie Boys like cover band. So, you know, yes. it, it's always... <laughs> It, I love when when actors do other things like yeah you know sometimes you kind of have to uh, doing just voices I guess you know you, you gotta get the creative juices out you know what I mean that's that's, that's very true right so before we get out of here um, I wanted to ask you what are your your goals for the future like do you have any roles I know Fruits Basket's coming up and you're back in it um, is there anything else that did you want to do in the future like maybe go maybe go to L A and do you know, maybe get folding chairs to do a tour or something? Like, what's the, the goals you have for going forward? Well, you know, I wouldn't say that I ever really want to go to L.A. I kind of had to make that call a long time ago. Once I started voicing in the industry, like, do I want to live in L.A.? Do I want to live in Dallas? And Dallas is <clears throat> my hometown. It's where my family is and my extended family. So it feels... It keeps me grounded, man. You know, part of the thing that you always hear from people is, you know, that, you know, L.A. changes people or you know, New York made you a jerk, you know, nothing on L.A. and New York. But uh, I think that when I grew up, I never wanted to never wanted to do that. And it just feels like it just feels like living in Dallas keeps me grounded to who I am. I went to Dallas for the first time for KameaCon. I loved it. I almost moved out there. I almost – I called oh. Cynthia Kranz. I'm like, yo, see if you can get me a house. But I wound up getting one here because um, I loved it. I mean, and Whataburger. We don't have that here, and I love Whataburger. Oh, my gosh, man. That is the – yes, that's the stuff right there. Patty melt, man. That's – oh. If you if you are out there coming to KameaCon, you have or even if you live in Texas, well, I'm sure if you already tried to live in Texas, but if you're coming, if you're flying down, you have to try Whataburger. Yeah, it's fast food, but it's good. I love it. it it's so it's so different. It's it it reminds me of of like the way fast food began. It's like oh, it tastes really good and fresh and not like garbage. So. Yeah, I, I love that place. But yeah, that's why I stay in Texas, man. It just keeps me grounded. It just keeps me who I am. And um, you know, I, I love, you know, I love LA and New York. It's just, it's not for me. You know, I like it here. I like, I like the life I live here. I'm busy as hell, man. I I work nonstop. So as far as my goals for the future go, I, I'm, I'm trying real hard to work on my comedy troupe here. I'd love to get us more performances throughout the year. And, uh, I have some other projects that I'm working on a few, a few years ago, I wrote and produced a movie called chariot. And, uh, it looks like we may be making another one here very soon. An actual like film, a live action. I didn't even know about that. Wow. <laughs> No, uh, I, well, uh, I'll I'll bring, dude, I'll bring the DVDs. I'll give you one at, at Comic-Con. Please do, because I didn't even know about that. And I did my research. I feel like a fool not knowing about that. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, uh, you know, that's, I, I've written, uh, I've written a whole lot of things. I'm actually been published before and wrote, uh, I've written three short films that we actually made. Um, and, uh, and then the feature film chariot, I wrote and produced that and, uh, have written a few other things and I'm currently writing a few things and I, I, I just, I like to be creative. So, uh, you know, the goal the goal would be like, ultimately Eric's goal in life would be, Hey, can I, can I write at home all day and pop into studios and voice act and come home to my family and never have to get on a plane again? That's my dream. But you know. I uh, I just don't like flying. 
That's right. Why. No, it's a pain sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a pleasure to talk to you. It, it, it was funny because the first time I ever heard your voice, here's a, a quick story time for me. I was in the doctor's office and I had pink eye. And I remember it was weird. The doctor's office had Cartoon Network on. And actually, that might that might have been the second time I heard it because I remember getting the VHS tapes. And I remember seeing Dragon Ball Z episode 120 and there was the voice of Trunks. And I was like, okay, who's this guy? And it was a good voice. It was a great voice. And I was like, okay, this is great. The one thing that I found funny though is I had seen those episodes prior to the dub coming out, fan subbed, and this is the Anime Labs fan subs, which took took a lot of liberties with. Um, the, in other words, they would throw in stuff like profanity that wasn't really in Dragon Ball. Uh, old school fans know what I'm talking about. And there was a line that Trunks told Frieza, and I kind of wish you would have done this this line, even though it was never in the original Japanese version or in the dub. You wouldn't have got it with it on television, but he pretty much told Frieza. It takes some balls to come to Earth half dead in a tin suit, which is a great that, line. And that is that is a great line. Yeah, because he showed up with the damn Mecha Frieza, and I was like, dude, that's like a Trunks telling him that is so alpha. And <laughs> uh, yeah, and it, oh, I wish I wish I was a director at Funimation because I would have had you do that line in the freaking uncut version or something. But I was 15 when it came out, so forget that. Dude, that's a great line. That is a great line. Yeah, those uh, fan stars were funny. Um, anyways, thank you so much for being here, and I will leave a link to your website and everything down in the comments section. Is there any final thoughts you want to give to the people before we get out of here? Um, uh, be nice to each other. Yes, take care of yourself and each other, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you, sir, again. All right, thanks, brother. Yep, we'll talk to you all soon.